Well, dramatic events are unfolding across the Atlantic Ocean with President Trump laid low by coronavirus. Now, this is a, a strange turn of events, shall we say. And I recall that during his uh, electoral campaign, presidential campaign in 2016, the uh, then presidential ca candidate Trump actually released a letter from, uh, purportedly from his own doctor, claiming that if he were elected, he would be, quote, unquote, the healthiest individual ever elected to the presidency. Uh, unfortunately, two years later, <clears throat> the, the doctor concerned, a man by the name of Harold Bornstein, told CNN that Trump had dictated the letter himself. <laughs> Fairly typical uh, Trumpian tactics, you might, uh, you might say. He also claimed that uh, Mr. Trump uh, eventually fired him for the sin of revealing the fact that the president took a, a, a substance, I think it's called Propecia, if I'm not mistaken, I'm not an expert on the subject, uh, to, to stimulate hair growth. He never, however, revealed the secret, which I'm still intrigued to find out of the strange orange color, <laughs> which, uh, which I assume is attempted to create the impression of a healthy uh, uh, suntanned uh, face, in reality, I think it it reminds me actually of a theron. Do you know what a theron is? Older people in the, in the audience will perhaps remember a character which I was very fond of as a young as a young man, or as a child actually, Dan Dare. Oh yes, Dan Dare, pilot of the future. And uh, on the planet Venus, for your information, there were three three main races: the Treens, who were green in colour. The Atlantides, which were blue in colour and had a lump on their forehead, and uh, the third race was the Therons, who were, had an orange colour, therefore strongly resembling, I think, the President of the United States. Maybe here's a Theron come down to Earth to do us all a favour. Anyway, that's just a speculation on my, on my part. Anyway, uh, subsequently, Trump, of course, he seems to be obsessed with his health, you know. He, he issued many medical uh, statements by doctors. There was one of them by the name of uh, Ronnie Jackson, I believe, who pronounced, who actually made the statement that President Trump was in such radiant good health that if only he would take, a, would enjoy a better diet, quote, he might live to be 200 years old. There's a, a frightening thought for you. There we are. So, and of course, uh, other medicals have also found the president with, with uh, monotonous uh, regularity to be of uh, excellent health. Although a slight uh, weight gain this year uh, means that he is now te uh, technically obese, which together with his age, of course, puts him, as we know, in, in a, a risk category as far as COVID-19 is concerned. But this man allegedly was going to live to be 200 and uh, rule over us all until then. Uh, now I find that his bluff has been called. For months, for months, the uh, US president and his aides have regularly gone about without masks, naturally. It's a sign of masculinity. How, how on earth can we go around wearing something as stupid as a mask in the middle of a pandemic, for goodness sake? Uh, and in general, acting as if no pandemic existed. I think they were in this, I think, honestly think that they, they were all in a state of denial. The president, of course, was trying to present, uh, to project a, a sense of optimism to the American nation, to the American people. Uh, but uh, the, 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 uh, as, if, as, if, as if by these means he could wish the pandemic away, they would go away. It was, he assured us only a mild in, 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 uh, infection, like the flu, he said, I seem to recall, like the flu, oh yes. Easily cured, he subsequently explained to us, by injecting people with disinfected, with bleach, I suppose, he asserted to the horror and consternation of his chief medical advisor, I think, whose face was a real picture, as if to say, earth swallow me when he made this, uh, 
this statement. Yes, and until recently, he was insisting that the pandemic was under control. Now, you see, uh, you forgive me for observing that uh, with more than 200,000 people uh, dead from this terrible uh, disease, I don't know that that many people in the United States believed him, although he seems to have a, an audience of, of, of camp followers who, are, who believe anything he says. But, but uh, there you are. Now, the president's uh, casual language about dismissing the virus and so on over the last uh, period has been taken up and amplified, of course, by his minions, by his aides, uh, in both their, who in both their words and actions it, 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 it conveyed the same conception that the pan pandemic virtually didn't exist. They invited hundreds of guests to the uh, to the south lawn of the uh, you know, you, uh, the rose garden I think it's called the United of the, of, of the White House for events. He recently there a few days ago they held a crowded ceremony in the rose garden at the White House in order to promote uh, Trump, President Trump's candidate, this right-wing woman, who is, he wants to put into the, uh, he wants to, to stuff in effect, the, uh, he wants to stuff the, the Supreme Court with, with, his, with his minions, with his cronies, right-wing elements. Uh, uh, and of course, in this, if you look at the pictures of this crowded assembly of people kissing themselves, cuddling themselves, and so on and so forth, several of the known cases of co coronavirus, it was, an absolute scandal from a health, public health point of view, and not hardly a mask in sight. In fact, uh, you will recall that during the debate, the celebrated debate, which reduced the level of the American presidency to unknown, to, to plumb unknown depths of degradation and uh, stupidity. But uh, Trump was so fit at the, at the very outset to condemn his rival Joe Biden for wear, wearing a mask. In fact, recently he, he made a statement before he fell ill, that is, that the end of the pandemic is in sight, quote unquote, by Christmas it'll all be over, one assumes. Yes, oh yes, but you see, dialectically things turn into their opposite. And this is a period like one that we've never seen before, but it's a period in which sharp and sudden changes are implicit in the situation and what what more? What sharper or more unexpected change uh, could one could one th speak about than this? When suddenly, without any warning, on Friday the second of October, disaster struck, and the world of these people, Donald Trump and all his, uh, <laughs> all the king's horses and all the king's men, was suddenly found to be turned upside down. In a matter of hours, everything was transformed, was changed into its opposite. Uh, and of course, uh, he was rushed into hospital. Uh, nobody knew about this, but they, nobody knew what to expect. Least of all, the, the poor devils at the hospital, they didn't know what to expect. They were told that a, an important guest was due to arrive at the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center, several miles, I think it's nine miles from the White House. The staff were informed that they, they must expect the arrival of a very special patient. The President of the United States, no less, was going to arrive soon, although nobody knew really what, was, what it was all about or what to expect. But here we have, here we have it, Donald Trump, oh yes, the man who systematically denied in effect that the coronavirus was anything more than a slight case of the snivels, to quote his friend Bolsonaro in, the, in, in Brazil, had now been laid low by the dreaded disease. Yeah, and not only that, not only that, my friends, the entire top layer, get a load of this, the entire top layer of the administration has now gone down with COVID-19, which they thought did not exist or wasn't in it affect them for some peculiar reason. And therefore overnight, <clears throat> overnight in a question of hours, the 2020 uh, presidential camp, election campaign has been thrown into turmoil. Yes, key campaign aides, surrogates, cronies, advisors are testing or have tested positive 
to the corona virus, as well, of course, as the candidate himself, the chief. Hail to the chief, welcome to hospital. Among the people uh, in the president's orbit tested positive, we find, uh, of course, Melania Trump, the first lady. You saw in the picture of the debate, all the, all the, the, the cronies, all the, the Trump family uh, parading in with their masks on initially. As soon as they sat down, they took the masks off and just sat there gloating. Well, I think, they, I think they'd be grinning on the other side of their face at the present moment. Melania Trump's is sick. <clears throat> Hope, six, the, Hope Hicks, the president, said he's sick. Bill Stevens, the, the president's campaign manager, he's another one down. Kellyanne Conway, former advisor. Rona MacDonald, the, 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 the chairperson of the Republican National Committee, heavily involved in the, in the campaign. They're all falling like skittles, like nine pins. Chris Christie, the former New Jersey uh, governor, uh, said on Saturday that he too had tested, tested positive after spending significant time with Mr. Trump, helping it to prepare him for, the, to pre prepare him for that preposterous debate that was held last Tuesday. This is how time flies when you're enjoying yourself. Yes, but of course, <laughs> this, is a, this, is, this is a crisis like, like, no, like no other, I would say, in American history. You can't think of anything like it. Because compared to this, the assassination of Lincoln is child's play. The uncertainty, of course, began in the early hours of uh, Friday, would it be? Yes. Just before one o'clock in the morning uh, in Washington, when the president announced, on, on Twitter, of course, where else, announced that he suddenly announced of the four winds that he tested positive for coronavirus. And that senior White House staff members were now in isolation. Now, these, it was therefore left to the junior staff members who must have thought that they'd uh, the, they suddenly woke up in a state of absolute panic and were frantically taking calls. And actually, the, the switchboard of the White House must have been blocked with calls demanding to know what the hell was happening. News about the president's uh, visit to the hospital. You see, he wasn't supposed to go to. Remember that? Oh yes, the the the, 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 the well-oiled machine of the, the lie machine of the uh, the spin doctors of the West was working overtime immediately, and informed the world, of course, that the president was perfectly okay. He was in marvelous spirits, first-rate health, health, of course, as you'd expect. And of course, he would be at his post in the White House. He wasn't going to move. He was going to be at his desk in the White House. Until that is, he was moved the very next day to, to, to hospital. Now, you see, you see, people don't, uh, people would not be admitted to a hospital, particularly of that sort, unless there was something very seriously wrong with them. That's self, uh, self evident. Self evident. And of course, the news that he got into hospital, they tried to conceal it. How the hell they thought they could conceal that from world public opinion, I can't imagine, but they did anyway. <laughs> They've been so adept at concealing the truth for so long, they, perhaps they thought they would get away with it. God knows how. Anyway, the news got out by accident, by the way. It, it leaked out accidentally. It seems that somebody in the White House sent an email without reading it, which is not a good thing. Not good practice, my friends. Anyway, people found out that the president was sick and his aides were struggling to cope with the reality of the virus as it unfolded around them and invaded their little offices and their desks and their filing systems and their computers. I mean, imagine the, the panic, the, the, the shock horror. The BBC, they tried to create an impression of normality. Of course, there's nothing normal about it. The BBC reported, I quote, a mood of anxiety shouting under few tears. You just imagine this, the chaotic situation of these ladies and gentlemen as they, as they were thrashed around trying to make sense of the situation. In the midst of the confusion, of course, they, the White House, they tried to put on a brave face naturally. The first reaction of this White House is to tell lies. Uh, they're quite adept at it. They've become quite skillful over the years, telling the most atrocious lies. No problem at all. The president was in good spirits, I repeat, and excellent health. 
Yes, uh, the uh, economic advisor to the president, Larry Kudlow, uh, his name is, that's right, assured the journalists on Friday morning that the president was working hard and, uh, there, was, and uh, there was plenty of good economic news before them, just to, they did their best. They, the, press was, the, press was even shown, the press was even shown a photograph, a photograph to create a sense of normality of the president sitting up in bed in hospital, evidently signing documents, official documents. Unfortunately, close-ups revealed that the alleged uh, documents he was signing was just a blank piece of paper, but there we are. We can't, uh, nobody is perfect. And they kept up this nonsense for several, they're still giving it up to the degree, if you can credit this, that, that uh, Trump actually got out of hospital, he, is, he escaped somehow, got into a, a special vehicle with members of the Secret Services with his, uh, his bodyguards and was waving at uh, the local demonstrators, uh, demonstrating support and so on which of course horrified doctors who accused him quite rightly of, of, uh, of, of a, a very serious uh, breach of uh, elementary uh, medical security. And despite all the noise that's been made, no, the situation is clearly serious, clearly serious. Uh, the president's aide actually took journalists to, after the doctors, the poor doctors, you can see them lined up poor like sheep to the slaughter. They'd always have been fed the line by the president direct. You guys better shut up about the state of my state of health and just say to every, that everything's fine, which they duly did. You could see by the long faces that they weren't particularly comfortable with this road, which was soon, uh, which was soon found out. People caught them out in the contradictions. Had the, 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 was the president being given oxygen? Well, he's not being given it at the moment. Of course, he had been given it, and it, it, it emerged. That's a, it's a serious thing. He's on steroids, the, the type of steroids which are only reserved for very serious cases, and he's given all kinds of experimental drugs, I assume, to keep him alive. So this is serious. And finally, the president's aide, real, realizing that the situation was untenable, he took the... Uh, the journalist to one side, and he said uh, that uh, over the next 24, over the last 24 hours, the position of, 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 of the president's health was very concerning, and that the ne next 48 hours would be, uh, would be critical in terms of his care. Now, what does that suggest? Perfectly clear what it suggests. And it shows that I think it, even Trump himself is forced to realize late in the day, that COVID-19 is a little bit more serious than a light touch of the flu. He's actually made a statement uh, yesterday, I think, saying that, oh yeah, now, now I realize, not from books, but from practice, I, 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 I got it, I got it. You certainly have got it, my friend, and how you've got it. And therefore, the situation is, is, is a serious one, is a serious one. Now, the question is, what, what's going to happen? What, what effect will it have? Well, it will, of course, have an effect. It will, of course, have an effect. The ruling class is quite uh, rattled by this. You see, you know, accidents can play and do play a role in history, you know. It do, as Hegel used to say, necessity expresses itself through accidents. This is an accident in the sense that the president might have got this disease or might not have got it. Although the way he was carrying on, it was, it was an open invitation that he would put, fall uh, ill with this disease. But in any case, it's clear that the investors now have taken panic. They've taken panic. The panicky mood is shown, it was reflected in immediate falls on the stock exchanges, the Financial Times, I quote, I've got the quote in front of me, Investors fear not just a lengthy dispute over the results, uh, I suppose, uh, the elections they're talking about, but potentially for a broader uh, standoff, even violence. I'll come to that in a moment. After the president's refusal to commit to peaceful transfer of, of power, should he lose the election? Now, this is an important point, which I'll deal with later. In other words, you see, a, an election which normally could be expected to settle disputed matters to some extent, at least, this election is different. 
This election, the ruling class now, and everyone understands, will settle precisely nothing. That's the point. The economic effects, of course, are, are, have already been felt of, the, of, the, of this crisis, that is to say. The Labour Department, the US Labour Department, recently stated that 2.4 million people have been out of work for 27 weeks or more, which is the threshold it uses to define long-term joblessness. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. They will be horrendous, not just in the States, of course, in Britain and everywhere else. There'll be a huge, a huge increase in unemployment and in poverty. Uh, an even bigger surge in unemployment is on the way. Five million people are in the States alone are facing long-term joblessness over the next two months. So with or without the coronavirus, with or without President Trump, the whole situation in the States is going to be uh, quite desperate. The same report that I'm quoting from sh showed that uh, e even as temporary lay layoffs, the, 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 were job, the, the rate of job, job losses was, was sharply rising. This has an effect, like a colossal effect in the collapse of living standards. But the, Trump, of course, prided himself on his economic achievement. He's blowing the, even now from his hospital bed, he's blowing the trumpet for his alleged achievements, but it will count for nothing. It is, it is uh, stated to look no further. It's calculated that upwards of 30 million people who re rent accommodation, rent where, where the place where they live in, in, in the USA, will face eviction because they can't, they can't pay the rent. Simple as that. Uh, and uh, the, the, this is despite the fact that they're trying to ban evictions, but uh, even now tens of thousands of people are being evicted in the United States. Now this, of course, is accompanied on the other hand by a colossal increase of inequality, unprecedented since the 1920s at least. Uh, during the pandemic, by the way, US billionaires, wealth, grew by $637 billion. Oh yeah, I mean, and what, what does this show? And then as Marx predicted, you know, a colossal increase of, of, of poverty and suffering, and agony of toil, as he put it on the one extreme, and obscene levels of, pro, of, of, of wealth and, uh, and, and riches on the other extreme. This, this, of course, is, a, fa is, is, is a, a, a finished recipe for what? It's a finished recipe for polarization and a, a, an explosion of the class struggle. Incidentally, that's why the ruling class, you know, the American ruling class don't want uh, Donald Trump. Oh, no. No, no, no. Their candidate is Joe Biden. Be sure of it. They'd like to see the back of Donald Trump, but Donald Trump doesn't want to oblige them. That's the, that's the problem that they face. And the reason they don't like Donald Trump is not because he's an enemy of capitalism. He's not, of course he's not. He's a billionaire himself. But that he, his behavior, his conduct is increasing polarization. Sharp, violent polarization to the right and to the left in American society. That's what they most fear. That's what the whole racket in the past of the division between Republican and Democrats and so on. It's a nice little game, you know, pass power, pass the parcel at regular intervals, one to the other, but not anymore. Even the fact that Trump says he won't accept the result of the election, that's an indication. The thing, the, the game has changed. The game is over in effect. And therefore the, 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 the prospect is that, of enormous social polarization, that's a fact. So, just weeks away, this is the irony, isn't it? What an irony. Just a few weeks away from the presidential election, Donald Trump is in hospital. It's not even sure that whether he's going to survive. Who knows? By the way, if he doesn't survive or if he is seriously incapacitated, don't, don't uh, celebrate too soon, my friends, because you can jump from the from the frying pan into the fire. Because according to the American Constitution, the next in line is, uh, is, is, is the Vice President, Mike Pence, who, if anything, is worse than Trump. He's uh, just as right-wing and reactionary. In addition to which, he's also one of those Republican born-again Christian fanatics, which is a nice little combination for you to consider. So that's no, no way out. 
Now, of course, the, the situation of the states is, 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 is serious, objectively. It isn't just a question of one man falling ill who will receive the best of treatment. May, may. Although I noticed they, they haven't tried on him. The, they got all these special drugs and uh, experimental drugs and steroids, which, by the way, are only used for people who are seriously ill. The, the medical experts have stated this. They haven't tried the, the real cure, have they? The one that he himself was in favor of. That's to say, they haven't injected him with bleach yet. Haven't in, injected him with disinfectant, which, as we know, as he says, is an infallible uh, cure for uh, coronavirus. He said that in front of his chief, <laughs> his chief medical officer was sitting next to him in the press conference. I'll never forget the look of horror on her face, <laughs> as if to say, Earth, swallow me. I don't want to be here. <laughs> of course. So there you are. That's that's the score. But never mind about the, the, the Donald Trumps. We don't know whether you whether you live or will die. Not particularly interested in the question. But as of October the fourth, uh, the U.S. now has 7.4 million cases of, of people down with COVID-19 who will not receive the same treatment as Donald Trump. You better believe it. And uh, 209, to give the precise figure, 209,271 deaths already. By the way, this death count, is, it's horrendous. Trump himself said months ago, oh, you might have 100,000 deaths for or oh, 2,000 will be bad, 100,000 will be not too bad. So it is too, it's over 200,000, which means what? I'll tell you what it means. This death count is around 3.6 times the American casualties in the Vietnam War. Get a load of that. Yeah. Far worse than the casualties in the Vietnam War. And it's far approaching the level of American casualties and deaths in the Second World War. That was what, 291,557 to be precise. So this is an absolute catastrophe. With this man, of course, denying that anything is happening has been an absolute catastrophe for ordinary people who, I repeat, do not receive the same kind of privileged treatment that Donald Trump receives. And everything now indicates, you see, as Abraham Lincoln once said his immortal words, you know, you can fool some of the people all of the time, and all of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all the people all of the time. And everything seems to indicate now that there's a hardening of mood, there's a change of mood in the United States. That everything indicates, the polls indicate that the mood of the public is turning sharply against this administration and its works. That's revealed in all kinds of readings that will show, for example, that 60% of Americans think that the government is making the pandemic worse, which is perfectly true. 20%, only 20%, you know, they're, they're, they're noisy characters. They come on the streets with their American flags and militia men and so on and so forth. They make a lot of noise, yeah, but it's a noisy minority. You know how many people say that they trust the federal government? 20%. 20%. That's all. Of course, it's still, by the way, it's still impossible. It's, it's, the situation is so unstable, so turbulent, and anything can happen in the few weeks that are left before the election. I can't see them postponing it, but I think that's ruled out for certain reasons. You no, know, the election will go ahead with or without Trump. It will go ahead. At the moment, Biden has a, a 14, that's after the uh, infamous debate, I think. He's got a 14 point lead over Trump, which seems difficult to overturn, but uh, let's wait and see, because anything can happen in the States. It is still difficult, if not impossible, to predict the outcome of this election, I think. It's still difficult. What is interesting, however, and let me underline this point, neither candidate, neither Trump nor Biden commands a decisive support in public opinion, in the electorate at large. They do not. They don't. So neither of them score more than 50%. Trump stands at 41%, but Biden only, has only got 46%. And 56, interestingly enough, 56%, that's important, 56% of people who support Biden say that they do so. For what reason? For only one reason, because he's not Trump. 
And that's an important factor. There's many, many people who are going to vote for this election. Anyone but Trump. ABT, the ABT faction, that's right. Uh, that's about the only reason for voting for Biden. But they, and even that is not a reason. Our American comrades uh, of uh, the American section of the IMT have taken a firm position, quite correctly, that they don't support either candidate. Now, some people on the left think this is wrong. They think they should support uh, Biden against uh, Trump. But I don't agree with this. The so-called theory of the, uh, of the lesser evil. My friends, beware of the lesser evil. This is a false argument. Joe Biden, by the way, let's I'll spell it out to you, is actually the candidate of the American ruling class. Now, the more, they don't want Trump, they want Biden. Whether they'll get him, I don't know, they might. Joe Biden is not just a Democrat, that's a representative of a bourgeois party. He's a right-wing Democrat, an extreme right-wing Democrat. By the way, Trump is trying to accuse him of being a socialist. I mean, that would make a cat laugh. I'll quote what The Economist says about that in a minute. But it's entirely false. I mean, just look at the record. In 1994, he supported a crime bill that added the, the, the death the, the death penalty to 60 new crimes. He added the two, uh, was, well, how was it, $12.5 billion to construct new prisons, which gives America the un unenviable reputation. I think it's the, uh, it's less of the, it's, it's a, there's such a, a mass inca incarceration, mainly of poor black people, don't forget that. And it means that the United States now accounts for 25% of the world's to total prison Populism. Don't talk about China and the Uyghurs, which they're always on about this. Okay, you can criticize that if you like. Never mind about North Korea. What about the United States, for goodness sake? There was, Trump was quick enough to criticize uh, the Chinese repression in Hong Kong, which was brutal, which we also, of course, condemn. But you compare that to the repression that's taking place every day in the States with people being gassed and truncheoned and beaten to the ground and shot and killed, oh yes. More than in Hong Kong, as a matter of fact. Let's uh, call a spade a shovel. This is, Biden also supported the, uh, the Iraq war, by the way, war completely. He's also accused of a sexual report, uh, assault against, uh, against Tara Reid, I think the woman is called. Is genuinely called, uh, for touching uh, females, he's earned the nickname of Creepy Uncle Joe, but we won't, uh, we won't expand on that point. We won't expand on that point. As for Joe Biden being a socialist, well, that is just absurd. As the, the recent, uh, this week's Economist carries an article in which they say, and I quote, the claim that the Biden presidency would destroy American capitalism is silly. Yes, and so say all of us. It goes on to, I quote, Mr. Biden is a lifelong pragmatist. You know what that means, my friends? A pragmatist, you know what it means. It means he's a right winger and a defender of the, of the, of the capitalist system. Mr. Biden, a, like, a lifelong pragmatist, is likely to govern, uh, govern as one, as a pragmatist, as a faithful slave of the capitalist system. Oh yeah, that's true. That means, the economist says, that means uh, getting sensible advice, <laughs> that's to say, follow the advice of the economist and other bourgeois, behaving con consistently and working with America's institutions like the CIA, the FBI, and Wall Street. Of course, of course. Yeah, but in, in, in the midst of all this terrible confusion and uh, violence and social upheavals, there is one element. There is an important element, that's to say, the growing influence of socialist ideas and even communist and Marxist ideas, especially among the youth of America, but not entirely among, not exclusively among the youth. I note that the White House, was it two years ago, actually produced a document against socialism, which it saw as a as, as an incre uh, increasing enemy, as an increasing danger. And they have a point, you know, it isn't just imagination, they have a point. It is sheer imagination when they attribute that to Joe Biden, for God's sake. But I note, for example, there was a recent document somebody showed me by the right wing, his right wing outfit, the Heritage Foundation, expressing uh, 
deep concern about the rising support for socialism in America. I quote, if I may, I quote, these radicals clearly see themselves as a revolutionary vanguard, like the Bolsheviks of 1917, prepared to strike when the moment is ripe to bring down a weakened political and economic structure. Interesting. Although they are comparatively few, they're talking about the DSA here. Although they are comparatively few, the D DSA has a membership of around 70,000. They are committed. They have helped to elect a number of national and local candidates. Well, <laughs> the, the, the less we say about those candidates, the better. But the, the, the document goes on. According to the polls, this is the most interesting thing. The mood of the country is favorable to radical solutions, such as free education. What a radical solution that is. Free education, free healthcare, horror of horror, and the Green New Deal, which would, uh, which would eliminate oil, coal, and natural gas as, en as energy sources. Now, this is, this is, uh, this is interesting. And it, it concludes by saying, given the electoral gains cited above, are we certain, it asks the question, are we certain, are we really sure that a socialist America is impossible? Especially when 70% of millennials say that they would vote for a socialist. And the article finishes on that note. Now, this is, this is interesting. This is interesting. And it finishes up by saying, we cannot depend on someone else to step forward. We must go on the offensive, disseminating the truth about socialism and the free enterprise alternative. That the report came out recently in uh, September, as a matter of fact. So here we have all the ingredients. Now, just to sum up, I've said earlier on, the, this election, it will go ahead. It will go ahead. With or without Trump, it will go ahead. Will it solve anything? No, it will not. It will not solve anything. The United States is living now through the most turbulent uh, period, I think, in history. I don't think there's any precedent in recent history, at least, for what we are seeing in the United States. <clears throat> and of course, Trump has been whipping up uh, his support base, <clears throat> partly because he's afraid that he's going to lose, and he might, might well lose. Uh, but he, he's actually inciting them to, to go onto the streets to protest if he should lose the election. He has created deliberately a feverish atmosphere of scaremongering, rumor, and innu innuendo in order to derail the election, which he's not sure that he's going to win. He's afraid of losing, as a matter of fact. Trump and his supporters have repeatedly sought to cast out on the validity of the election, suggesting the use of millions of, of mail-in votes as a recipe for fraud, which there's no proof whatsoever that that's the case. However, given the, the extreme polarization of American society and the feverish mood, this feverish mood that's been whipped up deliberately by Trump and the existence of armed militias and other things of that kind, it's certainly not impossible to envisage a situation that the day after the elections, there will be violent clashes on the streets of America such as never been seen before. And therefore, to sum up the situation, the perspective of which candidate is going to win this election really is a secondary question. I'm not even prepared to speculate on that. It doesn't really matter that much, to be honest with you, whether it's Trump or whether it's Biden, because ultimately they both stand for the same interests and ultimately they'll act more or less in the same way. That's right. Whoever wins, you can predict this, whoever wins, my friends, it will mean the opening up of a new and turbulent and violent period in the, in the United States. And one in which eventually, because the mass is only learned from, uh, from uh, practice, you know, from, from experience, that's the, the great thing. As Lenin says, as Lenin used to say, life teaches, life teaches, my friends. And this generation of Americans is learning very fast on the streets through their experience. On the, end, on, on the end of a police truncheon, if you like, they're learning the realities of so-called bourgeois democracy and the joys of capitalism through mass unemployment to the monstrous uh, 
injustice of this terrible disease and the deficiencies of the health system and so on and so forth. No, no, no. Millions of Americans are becoming radicalized, will become radicalized, and of course, eventually they will, the best of them, will be begin to understand precisely the need for socialism. And paradoxically, the more that uh, the media and, that, uh, and Trump and Biden also shout against socialism, that it's not the answer, that this is wrong and so on, the more popular socialism will become. That was the case in Russia in 1917, as a matter of fact. When workers went on strike and the press howled against the, these, this is Lenin, these are Bolshevists. They'd never heard of Lenin, the workers. They never heard of Bolshevism. But they read the papers. Well, I said, if that's communism, if that's Bolshevism, then I'm a Bolshevik. That's going to happen in the United States. You, you better be sure of it. And the most interesting, exciting, and inspiring perspective is precisely the rapid development of the ideas of socialism, communism, and Marxism. In the United States, a situation which, of course, will benefit above all our comrades, the American section of the uh, international Marxist tendency, which is at the forefront of the struggle, and which I am sure will develop by leaps and bounds in the years to come. Thank you.